Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Caroline Imke. Let me welcome you here in the Globe Theatre in Berlin in the Schaubühne. And let me welcome everyone uh, who's watching the stream, wherever you are. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to be able uh, to have this discussion, as you uh, might know, or maybe you've been following. Uh, this is a series of conversation called Transatlantic conversations on neo-fascism and this is uh, the last one of four panels and conversations we have had. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we had one uh, discussion, the first one yesterday, that was focusing on the question of what do we actually mean when we speak of fascism? Uh, is it a helpful term? Uh, does it um, offer us analytic tools to understand uh, the current trends of right extreme authoritarian racist movements and regimes? Um, or is it... Um, too burdened with a very particular past, uh, with a very particular experience in uh, very particular contexts. Um, we had a second conversation yesterday that was on demagogy and normalization and the question um, how what used to be outrageous behaviors or actions, what uh, was considered unimaginable has suddenly become something we experience, something we live through, something we have to cope with, something we have to uh, give answers to. Um, and we spoke a lot uh, yesterday about the different um, actors, the different institutions, the different uh, media platforms that uh, contribute to legitimizing racist and anti-Semitic dogma and ideology. Um, then we had today the third conversation, which was on anti-democratic networks, uh, about the connections between uh, different networks um, in the US, uh, in Germany, um, also about uh, the way they understand themselves to be uh, in a historic tradition of national socialism, uh, of colonialism, of uh, you know, slavery, uh, of a racist, anti-Semitic, uh, right extreme, white supremacist uh, tradition. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, we talked about what kind of networks do we need for democratic response to this? Uh, what kind of critical practices do we need? What kind of language or genre of uh, dissidence or uh, resistance do we need in order to uh, oppose these uh, developments that we're facing. Um, now today is uh, the last uh, one, or now is the last one, on memorial culture. And before I introduce uh, my guest here, let me first of all uh, say hello to Daniel Mandelson. Uh, he's uh, the co-operator. He's the actually the, the person who inspired these conversations um, <clears throat> uh, and who, who asked me and the Schaubühne uh, if we could do this together. So I hope, Daniel, I don't see you, but I assume you're there. There you are. Um, welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be back, and I'm, I'm happy to be back in a new role as a, as a panelist, uh, as it were. I'm very much looking forward to this, and, and on behalf of the New York Review of Books, I'm, I'm so pleased uh, to have been partnering with the Schaubühne for these events, and so pleased with the, the results so, for, so far. And I really look forward to this final culminating conversation. Thank you. Um, let me introduce, um, first of all, Alida Asman, uh, who is a scholar of literature and cultural studies and teaches at the University of Constance. For years, she has been researching the relationship between history and individual and cultural memory. She's especially worked on memory culture in Germany and recently published a monograph on the reinvention of the nation, why we fear and why we need it. Uh, herzlich willkommen, welcome to Alida Asman. Welcome, thank you. 
Uh, and here on stage with me here in Berlin is Sharon de Duel too. Uh, she's a writer, a publicist, and an activist. She received the 40th Ingeborg Bachmann Prize for Literature for her text, her Gret. Oh, this now this muss ich auf Deutsch plötzlich wechseln. Das war echt hardcore. Uh, okay, the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize for Literature for her text, Herr Grötrup setzt sich hin. Did I pronounce it halfway correctly? Yes. More or less. And she recently published a uh, fantastic novel called Ada's uh, Realm, Ada's Raum, which will be published in the US in the spring of 2023 with Penguin Books. So, Daniel, you know, look out for it. She's, she's especially worked in memory culture in Germany and recently published. Sorry, 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 mistake. I'm confused. In addition to her writing, she speaks out against racism and for the rights of refugees, for example, within the association Initiative Schwarze Menschen in Deutschland. Herzlich willkommen, Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, let us start, first of all, um, a little bit with a terminological analysis. Um, we speak officially, in particular in Germany, of memorial culture, and we praise ourselves for it. So before we ask whether it has failed, whether it has prevented us from actually remembering and reflecting, let us first analyze what that could mean. So maybe, Alida, if I can ask you first, what do we mean when we speak of memorial culture? And if I may add, could you maybe elaborate a little bit the difference between memorial culture, memorial politics, and historical reflection? Okay, yes, uh, uh, gladly, but it is um, <clears throat> um, quite a task, and I want to uh, start with a rather broad overview. I think there are three different forms of dealing with the past in a democracy. Uh, the first is historical research, so academic history, and then there is public history, um, which is not objective, but is collective or subjective. And then there is this third category, which I would, as I would like to call it, and this is memory culture, and this is a new word. And um, to define it, I only came up with this definition, I think, five minutes ago, because you are asking me about it, and I really had to reflect and rethink it, and I would define it in this way. It is based on historical research. It is framed by the state. It is supported by the media and cultural institutions of the state, and this is important, and it is kept alive by civil society. This would be my definition of memory culture within a democracy. Mm -hmm. Now to define it or, or explain in which way it differs from traditional memory politics, I think we have to go into uh, emotions, into the emotions. And uh, I think that's also addition here. Uh, we have touched this in the pr previous panels, but here I think they come to the fore. And <clears throat> in order to better understand this, distinction, I think we have to distinguish between heroic and unheroic memory. Heroic memory, you can have, you know, it's something that fills you with pride, that inflates your self-image, that makes you great. Um, and um, that is something that is universally um, <clears throat> to be found anywhere. And it is built on heroic memory, and heroic memory you can uh, have as a victor, of course, but also through a defeat. A defeat can frame in a heroic way if it is in a materiological um, framework, for instance, um, the Kosovo defeat or even the lost cause in the southern states uh, is framed as a heroic memory. And something that is now a really new addition is this unheroic memory, uh, which has to do with asymmetric forms of extreme violence and suffering such as enslavement or repression, extinction of minorities, um, and of course the Holocaust. And all of this had hitherto no place in nationalist um, memory politics. 
And because pride is, is a, such a strong gatekeeper that everything that goes in this direction is uh, covered under the label of shame. Uh, and shame in German, it's Schande, uh, is, is a close, closes the door to, to reflection or admission. So you have to uh, repress it. But, um, <clears throat> and therefore this memory is very selective. But the interesting thing is that there is a counter emotion to shame. And in German, we actually have two words for it. One is Schande, which is the negative form of shame. And the other is Scham, which is a positive form of shame. And we talked about it also in a previous um, panel. The positive form of shame, uh, which is a counter to shamelessness, um, has to do with the sense that one has crossed a red line, that one has uh, committed a crime, that one has violated basic human laws. And so the, this is a sense of a kind of conscience that is awake. And this conscience of a positive shame uh, is something like, um, I would call it a door opener to memory. And um, <clears throat> therefore, to introduce it now, uh, can be backed up by a human rights framework. And this is what gave it more and more power. Um, this kind of memory is not only related to Germany, but has become uh, actually something like um, change in the political grammar of memory. Now to include this um, kind of memory that had been excluded. Um, if I, that was incredibly rich. First of all, thanks very, very much, Alida. Uh, so let me just take up one of the threads, and maybe in the discussion we'll, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. return to, to probably a lot of what Alida has just said. But if I can take one aspect out of it. Um, you, did, you did speak about um, memorial politics or, and memorial culture as something that is happening in the public sphere um, that requires both individual and collective memory. Could you explain a little bit what, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about collective memory? It seems a contradiction at first. Okay, I would like to define um, memory culture in terms of um, being, um, first of all, objective, um, uh, because it's based on, on historical research, that, so that this is certainly part of it and not uh, really separated from it. But then uh, it is collective because it has to do with a collective self-image. It's about this self-image of a nation and um, not just of a group, but of a larger group, um, the whole society, I would even uh, say. And the third mm, element, it is also individual because it is, has to do with the way this knowledge is being um, actually uh, accepted or uh, embraced, I would say, by the individual. And uh, there is a really a big difference between knowing and remembering. It, we call it remembering. It's a difficult term here because it may not have anything to do with personal memory, but remembering is knowing it as part of your own history part of your identity. So this link to one's own story and one's own experience, one's own future is very important here. And it therefore is there's a difference between just knowledge and what we know about history on the one hand and uh, what we accept and um, <clears throat> also understand as our own history. Let me, let me uh, uh, ask both maybe first Daniel and then Sharon about this uh, idea of objectivity of historical research or the question of um, how much sort of collective memory actually even relates to memory or whether it relates to uh, something that is a social consensus or historic mm. consensus. So maybe let me start with Daniel on this question of, you know, in which sense do we speak of memorial culture as something that's based on historical research and that, that claims a certain objectivity?
can, uh, whoops, yes. we're frozen. No, Sorry, we, we were frozen a little bit. Um, I think I, can you hear me now? Because it was, yeah, okay. Um, I think we need to be talking about, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the, the idea of memorial culture is, is much more uh, inchoate and fragmented in the United States than I think it is uh, in Germany and probably throughout Europe. That itself, I think, is moving toward an answer to your question. Uh, and I want to, as I think of what Alida said and what I think of what you were just saying, Caroline, I think one thing that might be helpful is to have in the back of our minds the process by which individual memory becomes collective memory uh, and which sort of uh, the, the facts of what happened become translated into a narrative that becomes a kind of official narrative because of course there can't be a, a public or a much less a state sponsored memorial unless the players have agreed on what the, the narrative is, right? Um, so well, I think those are important uh, considerations. An example of the problem, I, I don't have an answer to the question, but I, I know what the problems are, uh, uh, is that in the United States, as I always like to point out, uh, we have on the on in Washington D.C. on the, the the mall, the grand central thoroughfare of the of the capital of this country, where all the important museums are, all the important buildings. There's a there's a uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum that opened in 1993 to commemorate an event that did not happen in this country. Uh, we have, we still do not have a official United States Museum of Slavery, which one would imagine would have preceded a United States Museum of the Holocaust. Now, one reason one could say ideologically or officially that there is a Museum of the Holocaust in the United States and not a Museum of Slavery is that we think we know what our narrative is about the Holocaust which splits into two components, very broadly speaking. Uh, American, American Jews obviously were deeply affected by the Holocaust. I know this from my own family history uh, because they had relatives there. Many uh, survivors ended up in the United States. So that's one narrative. The other narrative is of course the United States in its historical imagination helped to end the Holocaust. So that's why we can have uh, the narrative of the ho Holocaust and the United States' relationship to that event sits very comfortably with our national self-image. And that's why we can make a memorial. And I underscore that the, the name of this institution is the Memorial Museum. It's not just a museum. It functions also as a memorial. The fact that we don't have a museum of slavery which is the central event of the United States history is that we cannot agree on what the narrative is. So I think that we need to start out by thinking about the way in which history becomes national narrative. If we're gonna talk about memorial culture, we don't have the, the preoccupation with memorial culture that I think has been much more prevalent in Europe for obvious reasons. Uh, although I'm not saying we don't need it, but we don't have it uh, for those reasons. So I think I think about this a lot. And I think that, um, you know, I was very interested when Alida was talking about these three prongs of historical research, public history, uh, and, and memory culture. But, you know, one thing, and I have to speak here on a, on a sort of personal level, because I'm not a great expert in this subject, but what precedes all of this is individual memory, you know, and, and that is something I need, we, we need to factor in in this conversation because it seems to me that what we are right now, just with respect to the Holocaust, let's say, 
at a very critical juncture that only happens once in the history of memorial culture, which is that we are at the moment when individual memories of this event are being extinguished naturally because the, the very last participants and survivors are now dying right now. And so the moment when individual memory becomes collective memory or official memory or official narrative seems to me to be a, a sort of juncture well worth our investigating because I think when you pass from actual lived memory to institutional memory, you can is precisely the moment that the original evils start to reveal themselves because individual people don't remember anymore fascism and the Second World War and the Holocaust. When it becomes institutionalized, I think the danger is that the reality of it starts to become faded as hard as we try. Um, now, if I take up at least two of uh, the motifs or the questions that we've heard, it helps us question the term and the idea of, of memory, I guess, first of all. And, and the first uh, important one seemed to be uh, to say, um, well, there is something so fragile uh, about memory, and there's something also so contested, potentially contested about memory on both the individual level, I think, and on you know, the social, societal, or political level, that um, it seems questionable to use even the term. And maybe, I mean, Daniel, while speaking, was, was, was using rather the term of a narrative uh, mm. as something that is being framed, something that uh, is the result of political public struggles, maybe. Um, and that actually also may change due to new narratives or new struggles. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on, on, on your comfort or discomfort about uh, the term and the idea of memorial culture? Yeah, that's a great question, because um, I've been listening to everything and just trying to piece together in my mind. I have like a, a feeling of, uh, in German, I would say Bauchmerz, and I would, yeah. this little irritation, and I think it's to do maybe with the word we, when um, specifically we four have been talking, and the word we is used, and immediately in my mind uh, comes up the question, okay, so who belongs to we? Who, who's part of the we when we say um, we are erecting um, a museum to remember certain events that happened in the past, and some things are shameful and some things are not, and I think that's why in the, the whole discussion around memory culture, for me, in the German context, has a lot to do with um, who actually counts as belonging to Germany, who is seen to be um, part of the, yeah, who's a citizen, but also even if you don't happen to have German nationality, uh, the fact that you are living in a certain context and interacting with people who live in this certain context, you're contributing to the society, whether you have the nationality or not, whether you even speak the language or not, I would claim. You're here, you're interacting, you're affecting your context, your context is affecting you. And in, in to what extent do you then also count as part of this uh, whole um, yeah, nation that is um, struggling with a memory. And one thing um, I needed to think about as well while we were speaking was, I think for me, this word Erinnerungskultur, mem memorial culture, is very, very, you know, the fact that Germany seems to have like a reputation outside of its borders as, as being the, the world champion in memory or something, right? And that has a lot to do with the way that um, um, events around uh, the Second World War Nazi dictatorship, the Shoah, how these have been, um, we've got, um, yeah, museums, we've got um, statues, we've got um, commemorative events which point to those um, events and they, and they very clearly signify how people who live within the German borders should be thinking about it, what is the right way to remember the Shoah. And um, that is something that many nations 
have looked at from outside Germany and said, okay, we should be doing that for our own atrocities, for like, uh, maybe for slavery or in, in the UK context about colonialism, for example. Um, and for people who have a memory which, is, which doesn't belong to the whole nation memory, but a, a memory that's a particular memory, maybe as part of a, um, a group, for example, the African diaspora living in Germany, um, people who belong to the descendants of um, Namibians, for example, they might question this notion that Germany is um, such a great um, champion when it comes to memory culture, because as we've seen, um, Germany has struggled to integrate um, a narrative around its role as a colonial aggressor into this Erinnerungskultur that we have. I mean, it's beginning and it's, and it's happening, but it's very difficult. It's kind of in stops and starts, and it's very painful for all involved. And so um, I like to also, I, w I was going to write um, a novel once with the title Hedgy Memory, because I wanted to say, yeah, what counts as memory is actually a dominant memory, what we use uh, this word. And there are, however, people and groups and initiatives um, who also perpetuate memories and hold on to memories. And they, uh, if I may, I'd like to just do an excerpt. So I had this kind of model of there's a dominant memory and the dominant memory uh, perhaps has access to public funds, gets to erect the museums, gets to uh, make libraries, archives, um, statues, street names. And then you have the memories that I've not yet um, moved into the dominant sphere, and I call those, um, for want of a better word, fugitive memories. Uh, fugitive meaning something that's uh, a mm -hmm. movement that's escaping. Because I know in, mm -hmm. in German the word Flüchtling is used for fugitive as well, but I don't Ephemia. mean... Okay. Yep. So it's something mm -hmm. that where people are looking for safety, and with this um, movement, their memories are or our memories, I, I consider myself to be part of this group of people where we look for a different way because we don't have access to the public sphere, the public funds in the same way. Like we contribute through our taxes, we're paying for that too. But then we, in order to make sure that we can also remember, for example, um, the fact that Germany had colonies, um, how can we do that? So in initiatives like the Initiative uh, of Black People in Germany, Initiative for Schwarze Menschen in Deutschland, They've been doing things like um, um, doing street renaming campaigns. So a, a street that was called uh, Grubenufer in Kreuzberg was renamed. Uh, Gruben was a man who was um, involved, as a long story, and I'm not a historian, but he was somehow involved in this uh, colonial aggression um, and, and enslavement of Africans on the coast, which is now Ghana. So uh, Groben had a name in, in Kreuzberg, and there was a campaign over many years to rename this uh, Ufa, and it, instead of just completely eradicating the memory of this atrocity that had taken place, um, it was said that we wanted to do a new perspective on the memory, a new perspective on remembering colonialism. And so the street has now been renamed for a black German activist called Mayayim. The street's now called uh, Mayayim Ufa. And that's, I mean, I could go on and on. That's one of the yeah. examples that um, grassroots activism has tried to influence. Before we had a new street name, we had many, many um, campaigns, parties, um, demonstrations. These sorts of things have been the way that we've tried to gain access to the dominant memory. I think that's really, really helpful because I, th I think, um, correct me uh, uh, if, if you feel misunderstood, I think we, we could distinguish between something that is subjective, individual <coughs> memory of a person uh, uh, with a certain experience, maybe with a certain experience in the family uh, on one level. We could say there is something like a collective memory of mm -hmm. a social group, uh, of a cultural group, of a religious group, of people who share a certain experience. Maybe the experience of being uh, racified, maybe the experience of, uh, you know, uh, permanently um, marginalized, um, maybe if, uh, an experience of not belonging. Um, so, but also, uh, maybe a collective memory of belonging, maybe mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, belonging to the group that's not 
uh, being marginalized. So the second level would be some sort of collective memory. And um, the third distinction seemed to be uh, an official narrative, mm. a dominant, a hegemonic narrative that mm. then actually is also the frame for you know, memorial politics or memorial cultures or certain rituals or expectations uh, in, into rituals. Um, and I think that really what? helps also because it allows us to think of not only individual memory as being plural, but also the collective yeah. uh, exists in you know, a whole variety and in, in plurality. And the, I think the discomfort many experience with the official dominant narrative of memorial culture has exactly to do with its presenting itself as singular. Mm. Would, would that, maybe I give that back to Alida and to Daniel, would that help to clarify a little bit what we talk, yeah, Alida. Yeah, I'm very happy the way this um, con conversation develops because uh, what we started with was terminology and definitions and that gets us to a very static view. And first of all, to respond to Daniel, um, the, uh, the personal, the individual memory is, of course, key to the rise to the creation uh, of this memory. And um, um, I would say the 1980s, 90s were the time when very, very many survivors were ready to, to speak. Uh, yeah. There were others who were there, but it was the time for them to, to speak out and it became a project, a common joint project. And we have now 20, uh, I think 70,000 video arc, uh, videos in an, in an archive, Spielberg and in a Fortune of Archive. So from that point of view, I would say this memory is not exactly fragile, but it is not, not uh, ex very accessible either. And first of all, because it was um, uh, on VHSC uh, cassettes and had to be redigitized, that was another affair. So it, it, is, it is really fragile. But um, at the same time, I would say it was <clears throat> not the beginning of this memory. And it is not really dependent only on the individual voices because the framework was established um, uh, already before we waited for them um, to disappear. So. The framework uh, is going on along with them or started uh, earlier. And now there is a shift, uh, which is very important to, to <clears throat> think about, um, but it is not a shift uh, um, when a new really kind of framework starts. We, we, the framework is, is uh, already there. The <clears throat> um, what um, Sharon uh, said, and was very important because it, it's also part of this, um, the, the um, personal individual memory, this what Caroline calls the subjective memory, um, is the beginning in, the, in terms of memory activism. I would like to use this word here, memory activism. It's, it's, um, there is no hegemony there, hedgy memory <laughs> there yet. And it always starts in grassroots uh, uh, form. And this is what makes it so different from the traditional memory politics that we are used, which is always top down. This is bottom up grassroots. And it, um, it is a creation through memory activists. And the importance of these groups is being um, right now also uh, emphasized in within memory studies just uh, on the side by an 1800 page volume of uh, colleagues who have brought out with Routledge, uh, or bringing out with Routledge um, a volume called Memory Activism. Just really to give credit to those individual voices who stir up the ground and break the silence and um, start from below. And I think the, the German case also has some uh, resemblance here because this memory also started up from below. I myself was part of this framework in, in Germany. Um, in the late 80s, and um, I was part of a group that was grassroots, no hegemony yet. Uh, on the contrary, uh, when we um, had this petition to create a um, monument for the murdered European Jews in the center of Berlin, Kohl 
Chancellor Kohl told us nobody will care in Germany for such a thing. You first have to prove it and bring us 500,000 inter um, signatures, and then he would think about it. So I was collecting the signatures um, for, for a while. So there are always early stages when things look different. And it was really interesting that uh, coal also belonged to those who tried to um, fence off this, this development, which uh, finally um, then was taken from the memory activists into the society. It had to create a debate. It had to implicate many, many other voices that it had to be controversial. And uh, finally, it had to be taken to the voters. And the voters are finally those who decided. Uh, that was in 1999, in June, when the Bundestag actually decided on this monument, which was one of the step, steps in installing this framework. And um, <clears throat> I think this, this process uh, is important. And when I said it is kept alive by civil society, this is exactly what I mean. It is kept alive by <clears throat> those who, um, to, who disagree, who in, introduce new memories. We are in a, in a society that is radically changing. We are in a, <clears throat> now really in an immigrant society. And this hegemony is no longer um, sustainable in this <clears throat> very rigid form. And now <clears throat> we're exactly on this, I'm sorry, <clears throat> on this verge of expanding this memory and in making it more exclusive. And there is a lot of movement and debates going on in the, in the German papers. And I think one of the things um, that is interesting about our country right now is that there is so much um, strife and um, debate and discussion about it. And it uh, shows at least um, that civil society is active and that those who are now part of this um, state and society are bringing their memories and uh, what, what is uh, even more important, their view on the German situation along with them. So we have a new chance as Germans and now as, as um, <coughs> uh, re longer residents in Germany um, to see our <coughs> Um, environment through the eyes of those uh, who have arrived uh, uh, more recently. And this is, a, for me, a, a great chance to um, reflect our history anew and to rethink and to re renegotiate uh, this situation. I, I, I guess part of my worry uh, is is, uh, and I certainly understand, um, you know, everything uh, that has been said thus far. Uh, so a couple of things occur to me. First of all, the, the situation here in the States is very different. And I, I, I think it's worth recontextualizing our conversation in this series, which is, after all is about fascism. And so presumably we are ending with memorial culture because there's some sense that memorialization, remembering both uh, official and non-official, bottom up, top down, whatever, you know, hegemonic, non-hegemonic, whichever way, is somehow going to militate against revivals of fascism. I mean, presumably, that's the point of memorials. And I, 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 I don't know if this story is apocryphal, uh, but here in the United States, at least, the, a, a story goes round about the competition for the Berlin um, Holocaust Memorial. And there was, uh, uh, which uh, Eisenmann won, uh, I guess. And uh, there was a story that someone, uh, perhaps as a prank, submitted a, a design for a memorial, which was a tiny little stone six inches high that looked like a tombstone and it said, we're very, very sorry and we promise never to do it again. And so, which after all is the point, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a joke, but that's the idea. Um, so uh, uh, here in the States, obviously there's a different situation. So something I would put out as a fact, uh, I know this from my own experience. So a lot of American Jews, who one would imagine have a vested interest in memorial culture, 
uh, specifically with respect to fascism, already think that every Jew who died in the Holocaust died at Auschwitz. Uh, Auschwitz, uh, the, the date of the liberation of Auschwitz has become the date that we commemorate the entire Holocaust as a whole. However, as we know, Auschwitz was in many ways non-representative of the, his, the history of annihilation in Europe. The French make a distinction in their memorial culture between the uh, uh, mass, uh, industrialized mass murder and what they call the Shoah par Baal, right? Which is the, uh, the Einsatzgruppen in the East, which is how my own family perished. And so what I'm interested in is, you know, my anxiety is that sometimes in the desire to memorialize with a, with a, with a public narrative or even informal narratives, you know, uh, history can get lost. Important parts of history can get lost. And that, that I think is what's coloring my own, um, my own intervention in this conversation, because I think Look, memorial culture cannot do everything. And memorial, you know, maybe a distinction we need to be making is that memorial culture is not necessarily a history lesson, although a history lesson should be part of memorial culture, ideally. But the way in which things um, uh, happen, especially the way that information is now being shared informally in ways that were impossible even 30 years ago, I'm just concerned that uh, again, about which which narrative is appealing to be memorialized, you know. And I was shocked when I was going on my book tour for the loss, Die Verlorenen, you know, that many Jewish audiences that I spoke to were ignorant of major parts of Holocaust history because Auschwitz has taken over everything, because the the sort of infernal allure of industrialized mass mur murder has imprinted itself on people's minds and they forget that two million people were just shot to death in ravines so w which again which is the narrative and which is it which is useful i would is I, think, what my I think one way of uh, responding to what daniel was just saying and maybe opening another round of questions would be to say, I think we are experiencing, or we need to talk about the temporality of the official narratives or the official memorial politics and of memory itself. Um, and I think if I look at the German context, at least, I would say we are facing two different aspects of the temporality of you know, the official narratives. One is what Daniel is concerned about, that whereas we have official, uh, you know, rituals and days of commemoration and uh, memorials and, you know, uh, historic lessons in, in, in the classrooms, um, at the same time, me personally also, I'm, I'm very uh, concerned about there may be a decoupling between the official politics and the official narrative and the actual knowledge mm. of the historic experience, the ex historic events, uh, the historic text, the text of the survivors mm. um, and the experiences. Um, and so that seems to be one uh, aspect I think that that is that is marking our times at the moment here in, in, in the German context, where at the same time I think, and, and that's what I'm, I would like to ask uh, Sharon about, uh, and I think uh, what Alida was also referring to. At the same time, we have finally, uh, in the, at least parts of the public sphere, the result of the struggles of generation mm. of you know, black Germans or, you know, diaspora uh, community here in Germany who've, who've struggled for a long, long time uh, to shed light on the, ex the historic experience of colonialism that was negated, ignored, uh, uh, verdrängt. Um, 
And so I think what we're seeing, we're seeing this at the same time. We see the disappearance of a certain kind of mm. knowledge. And at the same time, at least that's my impression, and, and that's what I find, um, uh, yeah, I can't say uh, I'm enjoying this, but, uh, but, but, but no, but, but it, it gives me hope mm. uh, to, to, to see uh, the struggle uh, more to the forefront of the public discussion on colonialism. I was, um, I, I have a few thoughts. Sure. Yeah, I was really um, happy to hear what Elida said um, about her work in the 80s, um, collecting the um, signatures to get this memorial erected. And I realized that, I mean, I definitely learned something in that moment just now. And I, I realized that, yeah, that's part of the nervousness I have around memory culture is um, that at some point the memory that comes from the grassroots activists is co-opted by the dominant um, <coughs> context and then it becomes their memory and it's forgotten that it was grassroots activists actually who were responsible for it. So for example, um, oh, I'm on, I'm live, aren't I? Anyway, the... <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway. The German Historical Museum, Deutsches Historisches Museum, um, for the longest time um, didn't have, as, as, as far as I understand, didn't have much information at all about colonialism. I think they had one little glass box or something, um, and that was it. Um, and it was kind of disconnected from anything else that had to do with any other part of German history. Um, in fact, one of my close friends, Dr. Manuela Baucher, uh, was part of a group of historian activists who, um, and the website I think is still up, called Colonialismus im Kasten, um, punkt de, probably, um, put um, emphasis, like, you know, did a very critical analysis of what was going on with this um, exhibition in, in DHM, and also organized uh, critical tours of the museum. And I would argue, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, that it was through that initiative that people inside the German Historical Museum got to think about colonialism, how they could integ integrate this into their um, uh, standard exhibitions. And then there, was a, then there was a special exhibition, and now there is a much better integrated um, telling of the story. So I, I now, you know, and now when you go into DHM, you would think that they'd had that the whole time. And there isn't really um, kind of a reference to say, actually, this was because people put pressure on us to do that. So it's really, really, I'm really grateful that Elida said that. And then, um, Daniel, I was wondering, maybe I need to better understand what exactly memorial culture is then, because in my understanding of memorial culture, uh, everything that somehow contributes to telling a story of what a nation is. So for example, what faces do you put on the dollar bill? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what public holidays are celebrated? So um, we have this Columbus, what's it called again? Columbus Day. Is it called Columbus? Columbus Day. Yeah. 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 And, and now, uh, in recent times, in recent years, you can't hear the word Columbus Day without hearing uh, indigenous people and, and their allies saying, no, 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 we're not celebrating this guy, right? And, and right. Thanksgiving, the, may I point out. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. yes. So there, there's already like this tension with the memory um, or, or surrounding cool. Christopher Columbus and, and, and why, we, why does he get celebrated? And, um, and I just wondered if, yeah, that what you've said is definitely an issue, definitely an issue, but whether that's only due to memory culture, whether it's a, a general failing in the education system, and whether we need different movements all at the same time, so we should be moving um, more away from a single, a singular event, a singular thing, mm -hmm. which says this is who we are, this is what we remember, right. and rather like putting emphasis on the fact that we are many, many people with many, many memories. And I just want to throw this in. I'm not sure if it exactly fits correctly, but when um, I was thinking about um, the failure of the education system, as I was thinking about what I was going to say. There's this um, current um, example right now. Um, many people might have heard that Whoopi Goldberg is currently, she's been suspended from her show for, for talking about um, uh, the Shoah and, and describing it as white on white something. 
man in yeah. man's inhumanity to man. She said and it this, wasn't about race. She said it wasn't about race, exactly. And this is an example, I think, of what you were talking about, where there's like a yeah. story about what, is, what exactly was it that happened back then when Hitler was so naughty? And what does it mean for today? Ah, oh, it means this. And then there's a shortcut, and then yeah. some very strange story comes out. And, and I think it would be important for the discourse to include so many more voices and become much yeah. more realistic. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I think, look, I, I completely agree. I, I, I <laughs> uh, just because of the, the, the past five years of United States politics, I feel like I'm, I'm terribly pessimistic these days, but it's good to listen to you uh, uh, and Alida because it, it makes me think of the more positive things. I just feel rather desperately, um, pessimistic lately about the power of certain kinds of memorial culture. And, and so it's good to hear you to be reminded of that important point. I, there are just two things to Sharon. Um, I, I wanna go back to your excellent examples because they're very fruitful of both Columbus Day and Thanksgiving, which ha you know, when I was growing up in the 1960s, there was, they were completely uncontroversial and now, of course, um, and there was actually a, a, a bit of a furore on a college campus uh, recently when on Thanksgiving Day, uh, one of the faculty suggested that it be a day of national mourning um, because of the uh, treatment of indigenous people by the European uh, invaders. And, and so, you know, this question constantly arises of, obviously these events mean different things to different people uh, and that we need this plurality of voices, maybe not to get rid of the holidays, but to enhance them. I mean, why can't Thanksgiving be both what it has become, which is a, a celebration of community and family and all those things, and also a remembrance of colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. Over the years, Columbus Day, whatever its origins, has become a celebration of the Italian-American community. That's really what it is at this point. It's a celebration of the Italian-American immigrant heritage. Almost nothing to do with Columbus, I was actually. about to say, I'm slightly confused now, <laughs> suddenly, since when Columbus was Italian, but then maybe I got that Yeah, wrong. well, right. Well, you know, we think he's Jewish, so, um, <laughs> you know. So I think those things are important to remember. I guess, you know, I, I, I just want to say that my position here is as someone who spent a very long time collecting oral histories from survivors. So I, I think I tend to be oversensitive to the necessity of the particularity of individual memories. And of course, that's always hard to reconcile with the ultimate work of, you know, even the most well-intentioned memory culture, which is to create a, a manageable narrative, mm, okay. you know, and that, and I always say, you know, when I was on my book tour and I remember an incident in which, a, a, you know, and my book is just about what happened to my family in this very small Eastern uh, 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 Polish town. And she stood up during the question and answer period and she said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that at least now there's one book that tells everything that happened in one town during the Holocaust. And I laughed and I said, my book doesn't even tell one twentieth of what I learned, but I had to control the material and turn it into a narrative. And I always think the, the ultimate work of memory culture is to provide a narrative, a useful narrative to a certain constituency. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I always like to joke that, you know, so we Jews have this holiday, Pesach, where we recall the exodus from Egypt. And I always tell to people, you know, right after the, the Hebrews were forced, you know, fled, fled Pharaoh in ancient times, probably everybody was writing a memoir you know, uh, how I crossed the Red Sea with my camel and my two wives, you know, whatever. And then, of course, what does that become over 2,000 years? It becomes an annual meal where you tell a story 
and that's it. You know, so all these particularities have to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for, distilled ultimately into a useful narrative. And I just feel, because I feel so close personally to the particulars, I, I have a sense of almost grief because those are necessarily eroded in the process that creates memory culture. Mm -hmm. Alida, you wanted to? Yeah, I, um, I would like to pick up um, this wonderful phrase, a manageable narrative that you are uh, looking for. And I would like to come back also to Amanda Gorman's uh, inauguration poem and the two lines in which she said that being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's stepping into the past <clears throat> and <clears throat> how we repair it. And I'm, I'm really intrigued about these, uh, <clears throat> these words here, repair it. I, I find this very, very interesting. And um, uh, of course, how can you repair the past? Uh, the past, you cannot change the past. That's number one, uh, clear. But uh, what could repair mean? And um, we are now, right now in February in, in the United States, it's the Black History Month. And uh, this is another token for me <clears throat> that uh, the United States is really split up as a society um, in uh, parallel communities um, oriented in different directions and um, keeping diff not only different holidays, which is, is normal, but living with different versions of their own history. That is the point. Uh, we have a multicultural uh, <clears throat> um, multiplicity, of course, in terms of festivities and cultural backgrounds. But uh, the question that we are dealing with here is, um, is there so something like a, a manageable narrative to um, <clears throat> bring together back <laughs> A, a totally divisive uh, society, polarized society over this shared history. Is it possible to create a shared history over a shared um, a narrative over a shared history? And when you said uh, there is no um, official, and my point out official, there are many, many museums of slavery that are not official. And therefore I would, in my taxonomy, I would place them as public memory. And uh, memory culture, I would say, is not there. The memory, memory culture would be this ma manageable narrative that would be possible as a repairing gesture to listen to the perspective of those who endured um, the suffering and to adopt and accept that version of history as their own and uh, to, to uh, share and, 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 and join into this um, version of this history rather than leave those who are concerned um, alone with their memory. I mean, that is a way of, in a way, continuing um, a division that runs through the society um, that could be repaired in the sense of Amanda Gorman by <clears throat> um, looking at it from the perspective of those who underwent uh, this. So it's uh, also, again, like um, changing place names. Um, we learn now that <clears throat> that perspective, of course, that was a <clears throat> uh, the Gruben, um, he was uh, mm, uh, what we call to, uh, a perpetrator today, and he doesn't, um, uh, he cannot be honored anymore, and uh, honor is always involved in, in street names, and uh, first of all, we have to learn about him, and um, then know <clears throat> that this is part of our, um, the uh, German history as well. And it is important to dig up other histories and, and learn um, about uh, this history of the, of the dominant societies from the perspectives of those who have joined the society. Could it, could so I think this change of perspective is important. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think there were a number of really important uh, questions. I think in particular the question of the multiplicity uh, of, of different kind of memories and how we can uh, yeah, coordinate them or integrate them. Um, I have one aspect that um, I'm missing a bit uh, so far, and that is that we are talking at the moment about memory um, as if it was something uh, one could get hold of always, mm -hmm. whenever one wanted, as if it was something that was under control, whereas um, the historic events 
or structures uh, that, or experiences that we are referring to that we want to be remembered are very, very often so vicious, so violent, so traumatic um, that it is really naive and somehow in, ign in ignorance of these experiences to suggest that it would be so easy to reflect on them, speak about them. Um, so I think there is another temporality that we did not talk about so far, namely the time it takes to find a language, uh, mm. to find a vocabulary, to get access to it. And maybe that leads me to, um, to or let, let leads the discussion a bit more to both Daniel's and Sharon's work as writers who have in very, very different genres of, write, uh, of writing um, addressed historic experiences uh, of crimes against humanity or, 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 or violence. And so maybe could I ask first, Daniel, you mentioned already The Lost, you mentioned already your research um, on six members of your family that were killed in the Shoah. Um, could, you, could you explain to us a little bit how you, as both, as a, as a relative, uh, as, a, as a member of that family, um, and as a writer, uh, approach this fragility of the memory or, or the, the trauma of the experience as something that is not that easily told or described? Yeah, um, so I think uh, one of the things I wanted to do in my book and I emphasize from the outset that I wrote my book as a family member and not as a historian, which I am not. Uh, you know, so I, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert on the Shoah. I'm not an expert on World War II. I am an expert on my family. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the impulse for the book, I think, is worth talking about because it speaks to a lot of the assumptions behind a lot of what we're talking about right now. So I, I, when I turned 40, I just suddenly had this sense that if, you know, I had grown up knowing that we had these relatives who had been murdered in the Shoah, my grandfather's uh, brother, uh, sister-in-law and six daughters, um, uh, six niece, uh, four nieces rather. And, you know, so we knew what happened to them. What happened to them happened to many other people. But I suddenly became obsessed with the idea. And they were Polish Jews. So uh, what happened to them happened to three million other people. But I suddenly became obsessed with trying to see if there was some way to find out specifically what happened to them. You know, I was no longer satisfied with the family narrative, which was they were killed by the Nazis. And as you know, from reading the book, on the back of every photograph of these members of my family, my grandfather had written, killed by the Nazis. So that, that seemed satisfying as a narrative for many years. And then suddenly it stopped being, it stopped being satisfying. So I began this, what turned out to be five years of research and travel uh, tracking down the few remaining people who had known my relatives uh, in this little Polish shtetl. Um, and I say that because, as I said, it, it became an oral history of the Holocaust. I pretended that I didn't know anything. And so I would go to these people and I would, I would mine their memories. And the first thing that one learns during this process is memory is highly unreliable even, or perhaps especially, when it's a memory of a traumatic event, the memory functions in a very special way. So I felt that it was important for my project as a, as a, at a double remove from the war, right? The war was a, a thing that happened to my grandfather's generation as adults, and secondarily to my mother's generation as children at that time but to my generation simply as inheritors, you know. I felt it was necessary to foreground my own anxieties 
about the memories I was hearing, about my own ability to reproduce them, about the legitimacy of my project, which is trying to reconstruct mm -hmm. the stories of what happened to six, only six people, let alone six million people. And so my, I, I, I decided to put on the surface of my narrative these anxieties. You know, I'm always interrupting myself and saying, you know, but how can we really know? And and I always, I always like to tell this story when we talk about memory. So my uncle and aunt had four daughters, as I said, and there's only one photograph still remaining of these six people in the one family, it all together. And when I went on my research trips, I would, I was, I had found out the names of what were then 12 people still alive at the beginning of the 2000s who had lived in this town and knew one or more of my relatives. So I would show them a picture and I would say, this is my uncle Sam and Aunt Esther and here are the four daughters. And I showed this picture to one gentleman who was the neighbor, he lived next to them. And he said, no, no, no. He said, there were three daughters. And I said, no, there were four. I mean, it's my family, I know there were four. And I'm showing him a picture with four little girls, and he's insisting to me that there were three. So that's memory, you know. And I felt it was very important to put that, rather than trying to reconcile or to smooth over these bumps, these difficulties, these, these uh, irregularities in the narrative, I, I just put them on the surface because I think it's very important that even at the level of individual memory mm -hmm. upon which we are building these edifices of public memory, there's so much instability. Mm -hmm. um, Sharon, if I, if I take um, what Daniel has just told us about uh, his, his book, which is a subjective essay, <clears throat> which had research um, starting with his own family and actually focusing on these six people. And um, I would like to ask you, because uh, Ada's realm uh, is, is not just in the genre, it's something very different. Uh, mm. It's fiction, um, it's a novel. Um, but it also, you made the decision uh, to have many figures, not one, uh, in many very different contexts which you had to do research about, uh, I assume. Uh, and you do manage, I think, <laughs> in, a, in a beautiful way to allow us to enter very, very different time or periods, um, very different exper historic experiences yeah. of violence and brutality or femininity. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit curious what made, what allowed you to make that decision, first of all, maybe, and in which sense was that for you the right way to, mm. to approach something that is n not only your personal yeah. uh, background or history? Yeah, That's, thank you. That's a <laughs> great question. Can I do it justice with my answer? Um, one thing that I really need to say, because I don't want to forget it, is I was moved by um, Daniel's comment that, um, if I understood you correctly, you're afraid that when people are passing away that they're taking their memories with them and then there's a gap. We don't have access to those memories anymore. And um, I had to think about that because um, what I do with my novel, and I'll, I'll try and explain in a minute what, um, what the novel structure is, but one of the stories that I focused on telling was of uh, a woman who was um, forced to uh, be a prostitute in a concentration camp in Mittelbau Dora, and I have no access to those women, right? I think they have all passed away by now, and the only way um, that I was able to research that story was through personal testimonies. I um, read some of the books. Um, there's one 
book in particular called uh, Zwangsprostitution by Christa Powell, and she has some uh, v verbatim uh, comments by women who were in this position. And then there were a couple of um, document documentary films which I saw in YouTube where um, mm. actresses read out their statements and so on. And I had the feeling that, although I understood your point, I hope that the fact that they did give those testimonies and that someone like me was able to work with those testimonies to do something with literature was still a way that we can access that memory and continue it. That's one thing I just wanted to say. Can you yeah. Sorry, can you, can you, sorry, Daniel, uh, can, can you describe a little bit of the book a bit more for, for, for Daniel or the international audience? And yes, whatnot? okay, no, I'll, I'll do book. that, yeah. So my book is called um, Adas Raum in German, Ada's Realm, it will be called in English. Raum, however, has this connotation, it, it can be a room, but it can also be um, a space, an area, and, it, and, and I also try to think about how this figure Ada or Ada or Ada um, is, is looking for her space, looking for her own room um, physically. In, in, in the last half of the novel, it's set in 2019, and it's a young woman who was born in London but raised in Ghana because her, par uh, her mother died um, when she was just a toddler. So she's in Ghana, and then um, for the narration of the novel, she's moving to Berlin, and uh, she's got a newly found sister and the two of them are looking for a room for her to so it's like it's a bit thinking about Virginia Woolf's a room of one uh, one's own so Ada is um, living in 2019 she's pregnant and she's looking for a, um, a new place to live and when the reader gets to that part of the novel they are already being confronted with different uh, hints through images through words through through reoccurring names that signify that things that this Ada, Ada figure, uh, person in 2019, she has experienced these things before, but she herself doesn't really remember them, but the reader knows that this has happened. So these different experiences that are playing into 2019 happen, they take place in the first half of the novel, and the first half of the novel, the historical part, is split into three. There's um, West Africa in the 15th century, there's um, Great Britain, actually London in the 19th century, and then there's 1945 Germany um, in a concentration camp. So there are three different female characters, each sharing the name Ada, Ada, and they mm. experience similar things, and um, there are similar constellations of um, there's a sister or best friend character that's always at her side, and there's a kind of figure who's a, a masculine, like a patriarchal figure, who also reoccurs with different um, incarnations of the name William or Wilhelm. And, um, and it's, the whole yeah. thing is exploration of um, the past and how we in the present day are still influenced by the past, particularly traumatic events in the past. And the whole yeah. novel is prefaced by um, a motto that I took from the Akan language in uh, Ghana. And the motto is Sankofa. And I especially put on my Sankofa earring today. I don't know, does, it, does this get a Zoom or something? Or we'll have to um, Google it later. Sankofa is S-A-N-K-O-F-A. And Sankofa is a principle that is basically saying it's no shame to look in the past, to learn more about your past, so that you can gain strength from that to build a better future. And the, the symbol is um, a bird that is kind of, the body is going one way, but the head is turning towards the back, mm -hmm. and the bird is picking an egg from its back. So mm -hmm. this was my whole obsession, actually. What is the past? What does it mean for our present? How does it keep echoing in our present? Um, and um, I use also symbols to tell that story. Thanks very, very much. Um, so so he, here's why I'm so glad to have you both in this conversation, because it's two very, very different uh, artistic um, appropriations or, 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 or genres of addressing the question of 
how do we remember, why do we have to remember, what kind of service is it uh, to, to remember yeah. uh, different experiences that are not our own? And Daniel, you said before, and I was, was hesitant to interrupt you at that point, but now I want to take it up. You said, I'm, I, I was trying to write for, for one particular constituency. Um, and I would doubt that, or maybe I got you wrong, because Did I, I say would that? say that both of your works actually try to transgress particularities of a certain experiences or the particularities of a certain form of belonging? I would, I, 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 I don't, I think I may have used the, con, the word constituency in a slightly different context, but anyway, I think uh, something that Sharon is saying is, I, I think, incredibly important, uh, which is that in our conversations about memorial culture, and I think there is a buried assumption, which is worth articulating that we're talking about memorial culture as a as a means of resistance to uh, a dangerous forgetting which enables to come back to our original subject which enables neo-fascism right that 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 the work of memory culture is to constantly keep before people's eyes the the traumatic disasters that take place when these kinds of political evils are allowed to flourish. And Sharon, I want to be very clear that I think you've raised something so important, which is art is the kind of memorial culture. Literature is the kind of memorial culture and one that we have to take very seriously. Uh, you know, when one thinks of just to talk about the Holocaust, the incredible literature that has, uh, imaginative literature, I mean, uh, that has arisen in, as a response to this event is part of memorial culture. You know, I think we've, for obvious reasons, been focusing on state, official, public kinds of memorial culture, but art is an obvious kind of memorial culture. And I think what you are doing, Sharon, based on your, I'm going to order your novel as soon as we hang up, uh, at two o'clock, but uh, on on Amazon uh, you know, I um, I um, I think what you're doing is part of memorial culture. You know, what you're doing is part of memorial culture. Now, I would say that because I am not a novelist, uh, uh, that's not what I do. I so part of this business I was talking about about foregrounding the difficulties of memory, which was part of my book or the dangers of, or, or irreconcilable aspects of memory, is that whenever it came to describing uh, some terrible event in the story of my family, I would withdraw as the narrator and just quote from witness statements and uh, official documents because I did not feel it was my place uh, to imagine uh, what had happened when I felt there were very eloquent first-hand testimonies. That's just a personal decision in my case because I, I feel I don't have the skill or the temperament to, to do a fictional approach. But fiction is obviously a very important means of commemorating. Uh, so I think... Could I take that up from what you were just saying, Daniel, and ask to Sharon uh, again the, the question of... Am I allowed to? Uh, is it possible to? Am I the right person to uh, in, uh, in writing about mm. traumatic experiences? Um, I'm curious, did you ever wonder, am I the right person to narrate this story? Am I, mm -hmm. am I allowed to speak for these women? I think I didn't question whether <clears throat> I didn't question whether I was allowed to. Uh, I knew the question would arise, though. I knew that, especially, it, and it especially arises with 1945, the concentration camp context. People don't really worry about the fact that I, um, I, I think about um, a, a person who lived in 15th century West Africa who was 
uh, actually verschleppt, what's the word? She was kidnapped yeah. and taken to the coast and her brother was uh, sold into slavery. Nobody really questions me, right? And, uh, weirdly enough, they don't mind me doing that. And um, the story about uh, Ada Lovelace in, in London, um, the only problem I have with that is that I fictionalized that Ada Lovelace um, had an extramarital affair with Charles Dickens and that's a little bit, <coughs> that's tricky. It didn't really happen anyway. But the story in 1945, I knew, would <clears throat> raise eyebrows at the very least. Which it wouldn't if I had written it. Or also. I don't know. But probably not in the same way, yeah. Probably not in the same way. And I did it anyway. Why did I do it anyway? The thing is, I, I already spoke about the fact that there were these women who were forced into prostitution in um, a concentration camp in Little Baldora. And as it happens, that story, um, there were many more um, brothels, for want of a better word, um, um, in different concentration camps um, towards the end of the Second World War. And um, they were not for the SS, which is what I had originally assumed when I first heard that there was such a horrible thing. I thought, okay, there must have been for the soldiers, but actually it was part of a kind of weird uh, reward system for the, um, the prisoners, the imprisoned people, the enslaved people who were working to, uh, in Middle Baldora context, they were working to build this um, so-called um, Wunderwaffe, V2. Um, so what would happen is that the, the men working in the caves there in the tunnels, they were given vouchers. And with these vouchers, they could buy cigarettes or they could go to, to the brothel. And this story of these women um, was really taboo for the longest time. Um, I think when Krista Powell started to do her research, that was about the first time uh, that anybody had started to really uh, do any uh, academic work on, on that. And um, so it was uh, Robert Sommer also did a lot of research on it, and Jens Christian Wagner also writes about it in his book. And um, it seemed to me that for many reasons this was very difficult to, to make as a subject in German memorial culture, because German memorial culture of this very specific uh, context relies on a clear, um, I think you mentioned this already, um, you have to have a really clear um, theater and a really clear opera, who's the, who's the baddie and who's the, yeah. um, the poor suffering victim. And to, to imagine that um, there was this system um, where women were forced into prostitution for the, for the benefit is a terrible word, but for, for the prisoners, that really was too much. People couldn't really cope with this, with, with this um, how do you tell that story? And also the women were, um, at the time uh, when they were um, arrested and um, imprisoned, and then um, later on when it was about which uh, victim groups are there, what are the official classifications of victim groups. The, the official classification for them was um, asocial, antisocial, asocial, sorry. And um, they didn't get any recognition, right? Asocial people were considered, yeah, it was your own fault that you ended up in that situation. So, and of course the women themselves are not gonna be talking with pride or anything like that about what they experienced or, or who, who they had, forced, had, had been forced to become. So for, for all these different reasons, many of these women died in utter destitution. They had no recognition, no compensation, no, no apology. And I, by accident, found out about the um, brothel in um, Mittel Baldora that had to do with this Herr Grottrup Setze Hin story that I'd written, and Herr Grottrup was um, a rocket scientist who was involved in the building of the V2 rockets. And so I went to Mittel Balboa to, to try and find out more about the rockets and to try and find out more about him. And I, I stumbled upon this story, and I knew that not many people knew about this story. And I knew that I wanted to write a novel that would focus on um, a female figure. The female figure was important to me because I think German literature um, and memorial culture actually in a way is often very masculine, male dominated, 
sort of patriarchal focus. And so I wanted to have some uh, a, a, a strong female figure who is handled. I don't know what the word handled is, um, but like she is not um, just a victim, but she is showing through her different choices um, and strategies that she's trying to survive. She's fighting to hold on to her own, her own humanity. I wanted to display that aspect <clears throat> of the experience of those women in these terrible conditions. So I, I decided that my, I had to be able to, uh, you know, whenever the day comes that I maybe meet with these women in, in Yin Zeitz, that I have to be able to look them in the eye and say, I did it for this reason. I wanted mm -hmm. to kind of create my own um, memorial for you in my uh, novel and, and shed light on this story and, and have it again as um, a subject of discussion in the public sphere. Thank you. I think it's, it's, it's very important to, to understand the different ways um, art and literature uh, and poetry and film and, and mm -hmm. music um, yeah, are wonderfully precise and powerful instruments uh, for, for memorial politics to to lead over to Alida and maybe to the last uh, theme or series of questions that I would like to address. Um, what, you do, what you did mention, uh, Sharon, was that there are certain memories or experiences that were recognized and others weren't recognized. And uh, these women in particular weren't recognized. And that leads me to a question to Alida um, about the hierarchies of memories, uh, the hierarchies of mourning also, that there's certain deaths or traumatic experiences that we do recognize and that we do mourn, and there's others that are, that are marginalized. And so what I'm curious about, uh, when, when I'm thinking about what we've been covering so far, and we speak about the multiplicities, the plurality of perspectives of people of different experiences mm. um, in the past that we want to commemorate or that we want to reflect on, that we want to narrate. How do we avoid, um, you know, a hierarchization of pain or a hierarchization of mm. suffering? How do we avoid that? It's a null-sum game that you can only remember one experience of one particular group and not of the others. Yeah, <clears throat> this is um, a huge problem and right now we are experiencing it that the <clears throat> big danger of um, such a manageable narrative, uh, which of course is never manageable, thinking of all the traumatic stuff that it has to um, uh, acknowledge and, and uh, confront um, that this uh, narrative can become very hardened and exclusive. And um, right now, I mean, there, there is always um, a temporal process of development. And we talked about how long it took uh, to start uh, this now official memory culture in the after four centuries, uh, four decades of, of silence. And um, it took will take so long till uh, Sharon's book is published to hear the testimony or her personal memorial for these women, so, which is really moving. Um, so there is a temporal dimension involved here uh, and it will go on. And there's also a, an energy that is, is still at work and uh, memory is something that is uh, cannot be contained, that is definitely cannot be managed. Um, I would emphasize the unmanageability um, of memory in spite of um, memory cultures. Um, but there are different forms of, of memory. And um, one is, of course, also memory uh, to remember in order not to repeat, which means mm -hmm. <clears throat> to uh, end a story that is toxic. Yeah, that is so important. We have to remember some of this, especially in our conference panel, uh, context, we have to remember, recall them in order to not to uh, repeat them and to end them uh, also symbolically, officially, 
thinking about the lost cause myth and other uh, white supremacist myths that are still around. But there's also the possibility of, of memory to remember to rescue something. And I thought this was a very moving moment when we heard about uh, uh, Sharon going into this history and uh, having her very personal confrontation with these women. And um, I think a, a further way of um, memory work has to do uh, again with repair. And, and that has to do with empathy. And when we talk about literature and art, that is the, um, privileged mode uh, for creating um, empathy, generating empathy. And um, I think this is um, what uh, we have just listened to. And I would like to thank Sharon. And I'm sure Virginia Woolf would love it because with her <laughs> novel Orlando, she also travels through yes. Central. <laughs> It's actually it's I'm, I'm while really, we're talking I'm really on the yes. other stage here in the house, in the theater, in the Schaubühne, they have Orlando on at the up okay. stage uh, right <laughs> now. So it's perfect. perfect. Uh, Daniel? Well, look, I, 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 I agree with with all of this. I, I, I would want to conclude with a uh, with a consideration that, of course, all of this work of memory and memorialization is only uh, possible, it can only possibly work if there is an audience that is receptive or even aware. And I I'll conclude with an anecdote from my own research, which was a little bit heartbreaking, uh, but it goes to this question of the audience from memorial culture. So during one of my trips to Ukraine, which is now the location of this little town where my family had lived for many hundreds of years. And we took, uh, I was traveling with my brother who was a photographer uh, who was taking photographs of the book and we went to the Jewish cemetery because I thought, you know, generations of my family were buried there and maybe we would see something. And, Remarkably, the cemetery had not been uh, destroyed or, or vandalized during the war. So when we went there, there was a group of Ukrainian children and they were playing in the cemetery. Not in a destructive way, you know, they were just frolicking around, 10, 12 years old, little blonde headed Ukrainians. and. Uh, and we were there trying to read the inscriptions on the stones, you know, and, and I, I asked my interpreter, I said, oh, uh, ask these children if they know what this place is. Because of course the tombstone is the, is the sort of Ur memorial. It's the most essential basic cultural memorialization, right? So I said, so he said to them, do you know what this place is? Because of course, I should underscore that, of course, before the war, this town had a very big Jewish population and there have no been, there are no Jews there since 1944. So this little blonde kid said, yeah, it's the Jewish cemetery. And I got so excited and I thought, that's great. You know, even despite everything that happened, um, they know that this was a Jewish cemetery. Sorry, it's hard for me to tell this story. And I then had an idea and I said, um, ask him if, we, if he knows what a Jew is. And he said, no. And I, I remember sitting there and talking, if, if my grandfather was alive and could have imagined that there would be a day when a Ukrainian living in this town would not even know what a Jew was, that would have been unimaginable. So we, all of our discussions of memorials and memorialization, you know, it's only, if it only works if there's an audience, if there's a public. And I think we have to remember that. Um, thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks uh, everybody in the audience. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, wherever you have been watching. Um, thanks really uh, everyone who's participated in these two days in four different panels of 
um, yeah, thinking together about the questions of neo-fascism that haunt us, that uh, have much longer historic echoes than we nowadays want to admit, um, that are much more internationally connected than I think many people locally know. So what for me was, I think, one of the most important aspects of these two days was that even though there were panelists describing a very particular, very concrete, very precise situation uh, in, you know, wherever, uh, it, it resonated with something that had to do with, it was, it was um, uh, yeah, it was connected to other people's experiences. And um, I also have to say, I think from the last panel, for me, what was most important was to, to think that memories work. Mm. It's empathy is work. Uh, it requires training. If we don't train it, if we don't practice it, uh, if we don't work on acquiring the knowledge, if we don't work on trying to imagine what it was like, um, we, yeah, I think we lose a sense of justice eventually. And I think we lose a sense of uh, what it means to be human uh, eventually. And, um, and I think at this sense, it's, it's a good moment to once uh, really thank uh, from our heart, from Daniel's and my heart, uh, from the New York Review of Books and the Schaubühne to the Bildungsagenda NS Unrecht, uh, which is a project uh, from the Stiftung Erinnerung, Verantwortung in Zukunft and the Bundesministerium für Finanzen, who's been um, supporting us, uh, funding us. Uh, I, we really, really appreciated it. So um, maybe, Daniel, the last word to you. I, I'm just, thank you, Carlene. I just uh, uh, enthusiastically repeat what Carlene said and to say on behalf of myself, uh, what a personal privilege it was to be part of these four conversations and to be exposed to such uh, profound and stimulating uh, 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 thoughts from so many wonderful people. And on behalf of the New York Review of Books, what, what a thrill it was to be partnering uh, with the Schaubühne uh, for what we hope will be the first of many transatlantic conversations. Yes, that's that's what I was hoping you were saying. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the audience here. Uh, thanks everybody in the stream. Thanks Sharon. Thanks Alida.